Most are afraid of unknown depths, skirting shores thinking world flat. I'm with the island girls in celebration of new religion. Nobody led me or said this way. I sailed alone on makeshift raft with wind as companion. Fate for deliverance, confidence enough to assess new disposition. Seekers of lost paradise may seem fools to those who never sought the other worlds. Welcome to Momentary Zen with Zen Garcia. Visit www.fallenangels.tv. You're listening to Revolution Radio. As for wisdom, what she is and how she came up, I will tell you and will not hide mysteries from you, but will seek her out from the beginning of her nativity and bring the knowledge of her into light and will not pass over the truth. The Wisdom of Solomon, chapter 6, verse 22. Welcome, friends. I'm your host, Zen Garcia. This is Momentary Zen here on Revolution Radio. And I thank all of you again for giving me your attention and allowing me to uh, have you as audience so that we can share introspection into all things esoteric and specifically this has been a topic which has been on the forefront of the alternative truth Christian community with regard to the Godhead and to specifically whether the Holy Spirit is considered male or female and it is in my opinion that it is self-evident that she portrays herself as being a she within Scripture, which makes sense according to the Godhead when you realize that humanity being made in the image of the Holy Trinity, that it says, even for the pre-Adamites in Genesis one twenty six through twenty eight that they were made male and female in the image of God Elohim, the Holy Trinity, and that the entire creation itself is also in the image of the Most High God, created in the duplicity of male and female aspect. But for whatever reason, there's tremendous opposition to this as teaching. It's another one of those things I don't really, I don't understand. But um, since there is, and since I know different with regard to this as topic, I have decided to do a series of shows where we began, I believe it was just a couple of weeks ago, I did the show on the Holy Spirit being wisdom. Sophia is the Greek word for wisdom. It's also one of the terms that the Holy Spirit is referenced as within the extra-biblical and the canonical Material And so we began in that show with the ancient commentary of the early church fathers and their understanding and also the rabbinical commentaries um, of how wisdom is affiliated um, and is specifically the Holy Spirit and how she is regarded as being feminine. Even the Hebrew term, the Ruach HaKodesh, is a feminine noun. And so, and then again, in that particular show, we 
went into the Proverbs um, in the 66th book of the canon and how it shows clearly that wisdom, the Holy Spirit, is feminine and that even some of the other, uh, like specifically John chapter 14, which is the one verse where the Holy Spirit being described as the comforter um, would be sent by Yeshua, and it is referenced as a he in that particular passage. But again, even with that particular passage, when you look at the term for the word he in the Strong's Concordance, it tells you that it stands for he, she, or it. And in the more ancient translations, that word is transcribed as she. And so we'll, we'll cover that um, first to give you a little bit uh, of a background of what we talked about. And this being the one verse which so many people... Uh, it's amazing to me how they will cling to one when the Bible says that out of the mouths of two, three witnesses shall the truth be established. And then even when you look at and go deeper into those particular passages where it seemingly contradicts this as premise, all that is explained as well by looking at the the ancient commentaries and the ancient associations of those particular words and how the Holy Spirit was changed from being a she to being a he. And um, in my opinion, that is, you know, it's a mistake that got lost in time, lost in translation. And so we'll begin with 1 John chapter 5, verse 7, where it says, For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. And so I know also that many people have written to me, and they do not believe the Holy Trinity to be scriptural, but it absolutely is scriptural. Uh, and even the theme of the Trinity predates the uh, the Mosaic text uh, and also the canon and you know the English translations of them. That the Holy Trinity, as concept, goes back to the most ancient text. Um, and even as I showed in my book on the war in heaven in chapter two, where I talked about the Holy Spirit being a feminine aspect, that in that text I shared from the Thracian Chronicles, which are the most ancient script, uh, post-flood script, and which were only deciphered in 2006 by... Um, my friend Svetin Gardeski, his brother, Dr. Stephen Guide. And uh, Dr. Guide came to an unfortunate death. Uh, his family believes that he was poisoned. And I believe it was done so in order to hide some of what he was bringing forth. But anyways, at a later portion of the show, I will share with you what is um, very ancient. It's the oldest post-flood writing in the world. And the Thracians were a culture, the most ancient, predating the Sumerian and the ancient Egyptians by 2,000 to 1,500 years. And their script is where the ancient Egyptians get their hieroglyphic system. And again, as I said, in 2006, this script was decoded. It was released in a series of texts called the 
Thracian script decoded, and it has not been released into English. A lot of what are called the Thracian Chronicles, which is an entire collection of extra-biblical texts, text not found in English. Uh, and I have released some of those texts, well, three of them, aspects of them, within the work and the books that I've released. But I'll share with you this evening one of the ancient, um, it's the most ancient version of the Book of Atom and Ua, which is the Book of Adam and Eve, about the life of Adam and Eve and when they were cast out in exile from paradise. But um, there's a particular chapter that is part of the Thracian Chronicles version of this text, which is not found in any of the other versions. And in my mind, it shows to you that this particular version is the most, um, is the oldest, and it is the origin, uh, origin and original text for all of the others because it contains the beginning and the ending chapters which are not found in any of the others and they also affirm not only that they knew Christ would be the um, you know was the Savior Messiah and that they were followers of uh, Isis is what he was called um, but they also knew that the Holy Spirit was a uh, female. And so I'll share with share that with you as well. But I want to clarify these two verses as far as 1 John chapter 5, verse 7. The reference to the Holy Ghost there is the word pneuma, P-N-E-U-M-A, which is also the word where we get, you know, pneumatics, air, uh, has that association to the breath, the spirit, um, that it is the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit, that is our connecting link to the Godhead. And that it's that aspect of us, the consciousness, the um, the warmth, the that which animates our body. It's that spirit within us that has connection to the Holy Trinity. That is God within us, and that is the Holy Spirit. And it is referenced here in the Greek as pneuma, but just to give you a couple of um, definitions, the third person of the triune God, the Holy Spirit, co-equal, co-eternal with the Father and the Son, the spiritual nature of Christ higher than the highest, angels and equal to God, the divine nature of Christ, the disposition of influence which fills and governs the soul of anyone, a movement of air, a gentle blast, the wind itself, the breath of nostrils or mouth. And so these are all the definitions for pneuma, which again is the translation for the Spirit, ghost, it's translated um, in the Strong's Concordance in the following manner. Spirit, Holy Ghost, Spirit of God, Spirit of the Lord, my Spirit, Spirit of Truth, Spirit of Christ, human spirit, evil spirit, spirit in general, uh, Jesus' own spirit or Jesus' own ghost. And so, now the other passage, which is of great controversy, and it's the one that people cling to for denial of this as evidence and uh, even you know, further introspecting on this particular premise. John 14, I believe it's verse 26 it says, but the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. Now, it's interesting in, in one of the 
text that I'm going to go into, the Wisdom of Solomon, which had in its original, the King James Version of the Bible, in its original 80-book, um, as, as far as the 80-book manuscript, before the Apocrypha was stripped out of it, this particular Wisdom of Solomon was considered part of the King James Version of the Bible, as was the Wisdom of Jesus, Son of Sirach, and Baruch, which are also texts that I'm going to share, which describe in great detail what the Holy Spirit is, and they regard her as a she. But in one of the verses in the Wisdom of Solomon, it says, Therefore I purpose to take her to me to live with me, knowing that she would be a counselor of good things and a comfort in cares in grief. And so here, the Holy Spirit is regarded as a she, and she is called the counselor and the comforter, which is you know similar to this particular passage where the Holy Spirit as a he is referenced as the comforter which the word comforter itself, uh, now I haven't looked it up, but, you know, the women and our mothers are our comforters. You know, she is our comforter. And so that seems to be a feminine characteristic. And when you look up the word he there, where it says, he shall teach you all things, that word is echinos in the Greek. And the literal definitions for this word is he, she, it. And so you see there that the word can be translated as she or it as well. And so, you know, whoever decided to translate it as he, um, in my opinion, did so and and change the implied feminine meaning of this particular word in its original sense. And confirmation of that can be gleaned from what is called the, the synaptic palimpsest, which is a 4th, 5th century uh, Syriac text, and it translates John 14, chapter 26 in this manner. But she, the Spirit, the paraclete, whom he will send to you, my Father in my name, she will teach you everything. She will remind you of that which I have told you. The commentary on this is, says, The identification of the Holy Spirit as feminine in the synaptic palimpsest is no small matter, for this document is the oldest of all copies of the Gospels, being dated to the 2nd century A.D. It is a recognized principle of textual interpretation. Even by the most conservative of biblical scholars, that the older text, the closer it is thought to be to the original scripture. This is particularly important in light of the fact that there are no other scriptural texts between it and the oldest Greek text dated to the 4th century A.D. And again, um, looking at the older versions, the... The Holy Spirit, as I said, is described as being a she. And we can gain clearer understanding of this by just looking at the the verses in Proverbs of the King James Version of the canon. And in Proverbs 1, 2, 3, 4, 6, eight and nine, as I brought forth in the other show, it speaks about multiple dozens of witnesses 
to the Holy Spirit being feminine. Now, at the very beginning of this show, I'm going to share in review just a few passages um, of this because in reviewing these particular passages, you see that the only way you can understand what is referenced of wisdom is by associating her with the Holy Spirit because it was the Holy Spirit which preexisted with the Father and with the Son. And they, being the triune Godhead, manifested and brought forth all things. And that in the text on wisdom, as with Christ, they are both spoken of as having pre-existed with the Father, with Yahweh Elohim, with Jehovah. And the only the only things which pre-existed with the Father are the Holy Spirit and the Christ. And so it should be clear for any that opens themselves to this as possibility and that goes into this particular study with open mind and without judgment or bias or condemnation, it becomes clear and self-evident that wisdom is the Holy Spirit. And there's just no other way around it. There's no other way to make sense of it. And so we'll share some of those passages before going into this extra, uh, this other the apocryphal material, which again was part of the original 80 book release of the King James Version of the Bible. And so beginning with Proverbs 1, or actually Proverbs 3, in the latter portion, it says, she is a tree of life to them that lay hold upon her. And happy is everyone that retaineth her. The Lord by wisdom hath founded the earth. By understanding hath he established the heavens. And so, again, the Lord by wisdom, by Sophia, that is the Greek word for wisdom, Sophia, and that's also one of the terms that the Gnostic texts, the Nag Hammadi Codices and others used for description of the Holy Spirit, Sophia. They are all the same thing. Wisdom, Sophia, Barbello, the Holy Spirit, all the same, uh, the same principle the feminine aspect of the Godhead, part of the triune uh, Holy Trinity. And so, again, rep she is represented as the tree of life, which we know that Christ is also referenced as the tree of life. And so, here we have wisdom being... Um, reference as the tree of life and also that the Lord by wisdom hath founded the earth and also established the heavens. And so again, it was the Holy Trinity, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, which established all things and that preexisted everything and that only they were you know, part of the creation before the foundations of the world. And so, continuing, um, going to Proverbs chapter 8. 
it says, The Lord possessed me in the beginning of his way, before his works of old. I was set up from everlasting, from the beginning, or even the earth was. When there were no depths, I was brought forth. When there were no fountains abounding with water, before the mountains were settled, before the hills was I brought forth. While as yet he had not made the earth, nor the fields, nor the highest part of the dust of the world. When he prepared the heavens, I was there. When he set a compass upon the face of the depth, when he established the clouds above, when he strengthened the fountains of the deep, when he gave to the seas his decree that the waters should not pass his commandment, when he appointed the foundations of the earth, then I was by him as one brought up with him, and I was daily his delight, rejoicing always before him, rejoicing in the habitable part of his earth, and my delights were with the sons of men. When we go into the wisdom of Solomon, you'll see that the Lord God, Yahweh Elohim, speaks of the Holy Spirit wisdom as being with all men. That again, as I said in the very beginning of the show, that she is the Numa. She is the spirit within us, the Christ within us, the part of us that goes on and has immortal being. She is that aspect of us which being created of the fabric, the source, the force of the Most High God has eternal life unless we are blotted out. But it is that aspect of us which is immortal. And ending this, it says, Now therefore hearken unto me, O children, O blessed are they that keep my ways. Hear instruction and be wise and refuse it not. Blessed is the man that heareth me watching daily at my gates, waiting at the post of my doors. For whoso findeth me findeth life and shall obtain favor of the Lord. For whoso findeth me findeth life. That is the same thing that Jesus, Yeshua, the Christ said, of himself in John 6 30, verse 35 Jesus said to them I am the bread of life whoever comes to me shall not hunger and whoever believes in me shall never thirst in verse chapter 8 verse 12 and Jesus spoke to them saying I am the light of the world whoever follows me will not walk in darkness but will have the light of life and so Again, here we have the same, the correlation of wisdom with Christ. That whoso findeth me findeth life. And we know that that is in reference to Yeshua as the Christ. But here in Proverbs, it is used as reference to wisdom the Holy Spirit, which again, only she preexisted with the Father and the Son. One final verse, John chapter 11, verse 25 and 26. I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? John 14, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. So, again, we're going to uh, link these connections, but I want to go really quick to the Aramaic version of Proverbs chapter 8. 
because in the Aramaic version, it speaks of the Holy Spirit as being a handmaiden. And again, you know, the feminine characteristic. And it also shows that in this particular Proverbs that many associate it with being in reference to Christ, but it is actually the entirety of the early chapters of Proverbs 1 through 10 are all speaking about wisdom, the Holy Spirit. And I'll give you confirmation of that. All right, this is the Aramaic version of Proverbs 8. Therefore, wisdom cries out, and understanding raises her voice. On top of the heights, by the way, is she, and she stands among the paths. And at the gates, at the entrance of the town, and at the entrance of the gates, she cries out and says, To you, men, I call, and my cry is to the sons of men. Simple ones, understand prudence, and let fools reason in their heart. Hear, for I am speaking truth, and the speech of my mouth is uprightness, for my mouth meditates truth, and wickedness is an abomination to my lips. And in righteousness are all the utterances of my mouth, and there is no perversity or crookedness in them. I'm going to skip on to verse 25, which um, speaking about, you know, the how she pre-existed the creation. Starting with verse 22. God created me at the beginning of his creation before his works from the beginning. Before the world, I was made ready. From the beginning, before the earth was. While there were still no depths, I was born. And while there were no streams, storehouses of water, before the mountains took shape and before the hills, I was begotten. Before he had made the earth and rivers or the beginning of the dust of the world, when he prepared the heavens, there was I. And while he drew a circle on the face of the deep, and when he made substantial the clouds above and made strong the springs of the deep, and when he set for the sea its limit that the water should not pass beyond it, set the foundations of the earth, then I was beside him, a faithful handmaid. And while he was rejoicing in me day by day, I was rejoicing before him always. Uh, another thing really quickly. See here, we see that Proverbs 8, a faithful handmaid, that is most certainly speaking about the Holy Spirit as a feminine principle. And as I said, in Wisdom of Solomon, we will see that it describes the Most High, the Father, loving the Holy Spirit. And that she was beside him, that she sits beside him while he is on his throne. So continuing, I was rejoicing in this inhabitable world and my pleasure was in mankind. And now, sons, listen to me, and happy is he who guards my paths. Hear correction and be wise and do not dismiss it. Happy is the man who listens to me and keeps vigil at my threshold every day so as to guard my doorposts. For whoever finds me finds life and he will have favor from God. But whoever sins against me damages himself, and all those hate, who hate me love death. And so now we're going to go into the other, um, some of these other texts. Baruch, the wisdom of uh, Jesus, son of Sirach, and the wisdom of Solomon. To show you that it is only by associating wisdom with the Holy Spirit that one can understand. Because, again, it is only the Holy Spirit that preexisted with the Father and the Son. But um, as I will bring forth here, 
wisdom being described as pre-existent with the Father and the Son, you know that wisdom is the Holy Spirit. And she is clearly referenced in all of these verses, all of these chapters and passages that I will bring forth as a she. We're going to begin with the wisdom of Jesus, son of Sirach, which is also called the book of Ecclesiasticus. It is one of the 14 books of the Apocrypha, which again had been uh, part of the original 80 book version of the King James Holy Bible. It says this. All wisdom cometh from the Lord and is with him forever. Who can number the sand of the sea and the drops of rain and the days of eternity? Who can find out the height of heaven and the breadth of the earth and the deep and wisdom? Wisdom hath been created before all things and the understanding of prudence from everlasting. The word of God most high is the fountain of wisdom and her ways are everlasting commandments. Uh, I just want to stop to highlight this chapter one, verse four. Again, wisdom hath been created before all things. That's exactly what we read from in Proverbs, that she was with the Father and the Son, the Word, before the foundations of the earth, before the hills were made manifest, before the clouds took form, before the creation was given substance. And it says that same thing here. The Word of God Most High is the fountain of wisdom. And so we see that it is from the word, the Christ, that the water, uh, the waters which are spoken about as Oceanus, that Oceanus takes uh, and is cleansed by the root of the tree of life, which is the word. And so, you know, again, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, they are all one even though they are individual as, you know, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the Mother, but they are all together uh, a singularity in oneness they connect. All right, continuing. To whom hath the root of wisdom been revealed? Or who hath known her wise counsels? Unto whom hath the knowledge of wisdom been made manifest? And who hath understood her great experience? There is one wise and greatly to be feared, the Lord sitting upon his throne. He created her and saw her and numbered her and poured her out upon all his works. She is with all flesh, according to his gift, and he hath given her to them that love him. She hath built an everlasting foundation with men, and she shall continue with their seed. To fear the Lord is fullness of wisdom, and filleth men with her fruits. She filleth all their house with things desirable and garners with her increase. Again, that's the wisdom of Jesus, son of Sirach, chapter 1, verses 1 through 10 and 15 through 17. I'm going to share a couple other really quick verses about uh, from different texts. This is from 2 Ezra, chapter 13, verse 55. It says, Thy life hast thou ordered in wisdom and hast called understanding thy mother. The wisdom of Jesus sent us rock, 
chapter 1, verse 26. If thou desire wisdom, keep the commandments, and the Lord shall give her unto thee. So, you know, over and over and over, wisdom is described as a female in feminine aspect. All right, this is from Baruch chapter 3, verses 9 through 32. And then we're going to go into the wisdom of Solomon because the wisdom of Solomon contains the most complete, the most detailed and clear uh, teaching lesson on who wisdom is and understanding and reading and studying those chapters 6 through 12. Again, it is undeniable that the Holy Spirit is female. Um, and yet, you know, so many want to oppose me on this and you know, I can give you multiple, multiples, and multiple witnesses to this as being truth. All right. Hear, Israel, the commandments of life. Give ear to understand wisdom. How happeneth it, Israel, that thou art in thine enemy's hands and land, that thou art waxen old in a strange country? that thou art defiled with the dead, that thou art counted with them that go down into the grave. Thou hast forsaken the fountain of wisdom, for if thou hadst walked in the way of God, thou shouldst have dwelt in peace forever. Learn where is wisdom, where is strength, where is understanding, that thou mayest know also where is length of days and life? Where is the light of the eyes and peace? Who hath found out her place? Or who hath come into her treasures? Where are the princes of the heathen become, and such as ruled the beasts upon the earth? They that had their pastime with the fowls of the air, and they that hoarded up silver and gold, wherein men trust and made no end of their getting. For they that rout in silver and were so careful, and whose works are unsearchable, they are vanished and gone down to the grave, and others are come up in their steads. Young men have seen light and dwelt upon the earth, but the way of knowledge have they not known, not understood the past thereof nor laid hold of it. Their children were far off from that way. It hath not been heard of in Shannon, neither hath it been seen in Themon, the Argyrenes that seek wisdom upon earth. The merchants of Moran and of Themon, the authors of fables and searchers out of understanding, None of these have known the way of wisdom or remember her paths. O Israel, how great is the house of God and how large is the place of his possession. Great and hath none end high and unmeasurable. There were the giants famous from the beginning that were of so great stature and so expert in war. Those did not the Lord choose, neither gave he the way of knowledge unto them, but they were destroyed because they had no wisdom and perished through their own foolishness. Who hath gone up into heaven and taken her and brought her down from the clouds? Who hath gone over the sea and found her and will bring her for pure gold? No man knoweth her way, nor thinketh of her path, but he that knoweth all things knoweth her and hath found her out with his understanding. 
Again, that's Baruch chapter 3, verse 9 through 32. Okay, and so you can see that there are many texts, many confirming witnesses, all referencing the Holy Spirit, wisdom as being feminine. Which again, when you look up the Hebrew word for the Holy Spirit, the Ruach HaKodesh, it is a feminine noun. And in the Syriac, um, the Ruach HaKodesh is also referenced as being feminine. In the Greek, it is gender neutral. And it was upon translation into the Greek that the later transcribers shifted and changed the Holy Spirit from being female to being male. And so once they did so, then, only then did the knowledge that the Holy Spirit was female become lost. And modern humanity, the mainstream churches, all of them believe the Godhead to be homosexual. But it is only through women that children can be conceived and begotten. Just as it is in amongst humans, only women conceive and bring forth children. Everything is begotten of women. And so we see that the Holy Spirit being described as the mother, that it makes sense in the many Gnostic texts and uh, the Nakamati Codices where it speaks about the fall of Sophia, that she was brought forth by the Father and that she begot Christ as the light of the world. And so, and, and in my opinion also, once people understand that the Holy Spirit is female, that when they read and study a lot of these lost and little understood texts, uh, some of these extra biblical books, which reference Sophia and the Holy Spirit as being feminine, that you will better be and be able to grasp what they are talking about. Because many of these books, especially with the Nakamati Codices, they are books that were given to the apostles after the resurrection of Christ. And he is no longer speaking in parable, but tells them straight up in very advanced discourse about um, some of the deeper, more profound aspects of Scripture that are little understood. And that's why, in my opinion, many of these texts are ridiculed and condemned because they are little understood. And part of that has to do with um, our modern English translations having been misconstrued in manner which throws off modern interpretation from ancient perspective. But in reality, there is an underlying truth which connects both of them in that when you have the proper understanding of what is being spoken of even in our modern translations, because this teaching is clearly encoded into the King James Bible. Proverbs clearly denotes that the Holy Spirit is female. As I'm bringing forth here, 
from the apocryphal texts again, which were part of the original King James version of the canon. So let me go ahead and start with the wisdom of Solomon before we get to first break. I mean, and yes, we're going to begin with um, chapter six, verse one. Hear therefore, O ye kings, and understand. Learn ye that be judges of the ends of the earth. Give ear, ye that rule the people, and glorify a multitude of nations. For power is given you of the Lord, and sovereignty from the highest. Who shall try your works and search out your counsels? Because being ministers of his kingdom, ye have not judged aright nor kept the laws, nor walked after the counsels of God. Horribly and speedily shall he come upon you, for a sharp judgment shall be to them that be in high places. For mercy will soon pardon the mean, meanest, but mighty men shall be mightily tormented. For he which is Lord over all shall fear no man's person, Neither shall he stand in awe of any man's greatness, for he hath made the mighty. Unto you, therefore, O kings, do I speak, that ye may learn wisdom and not fall away. For they that keep holiness holily shall be judged holy, and they that have learned such things shall find what to answer. Wherefore, Set your affection upon my words, desire them, and ye shall be instructed. Wisdom is glorious and never fadeth away. Yea, she is easily seen of them that love her and found of such as seek her. She preventeth them that desireth her in making herself first known unto them. Whoso seeketh her early shall have no great travail, for he shall find her sitting at his doors. To think thereof, for upon her is perfection of wisdom, and whoso watcheth, watcheth for her shall quickly be without care. For she goeth about seeking such as are worthy of her, showeth herself favorably unto them in the ways, and meeteth them in every thought. For the very true beginning of her is the desire of discipline, and the care of discipline is love, and love is the keeping of her laws, and the giving heed unto her laws is the assurance of incorruption. And incorruption maketh us near unto God. Therefore, the desire of wisdom bringeth to a kingdom. If you delight, be then in thrones and scepters, O ye kings of the people. Honor wisdom, that ye may reign forevermore. As for wisdom, what she is, and how she came up, I will tell you and will not hide mysteries from you, but will seek her out from the beginning. All right, we'll be right back. back everybody for a second hour i'm your host zen garcia this is momentary zen and this show is a follow-up to the one that we did two weeks ago beginning with the 
Holy Spirit, Sophia, wisdom being a feminine uh, entity um, and regarded as the feminine aspect of the Godhead. Now, another thing that is very interesting about these particular apocryphal texts is that they make a lot of mentions to the giant, as I had brought forth in the the previous passage on the wisdom of Sirach, where it spoke about, um, it says, he was not pacified toward the old giants who fell away in the strength of their foolishness. Uh, there's a passage in the wisdom of Solomon, chapter 14, verse 6, where it says, for in the old time also when the proud giants perished, the hope of the world governed by thy hand escaped in a weak vessel and left to all ages a seed of generation. Um, we'll see in this text that it speaks about the Holy Spirit as wisdom, as helping many of the patriarchs of old as well. And we'll get into that in a short bit, but I want to share one more thing with you here. It's from the book of Judith. It says, For the mighty one did not fall by the young men, neither did the sons of the titans smite him, nor high giants set upon him. But Judith, the daughter of Merari, weakened him with the beauty of her countenance. And so, you know, again, as I said, there's many mentions of giants all throughout these particular texts as well, which is another one of those just truly fascinating aspects of the Bible, which having been regarded as mythology for so very long time is also now being affirmed as truth. As so much information has come forth onto the internet, the stories of the ancient history of America, the early pioneers, and the uh, difficulties uh, that they had in farming the land with so many stone structures, giant mounds that when they were dug into, excavated, and uh, extracted, there were oftentimes uh, bones of these giants found within them. Some of the skulls even having horns. I mean, just fascinating, absolutely fascinating information. All right, so we're going to continue. I had gotten to a very interesting part, which was the verse that, I opened the show with, it says, as for wisdom, what she is and how she came up, I will tell you and will not hide mysteries from you, but will seek her out from the beginning of her nativity and bring the knowledge of her into light and will not pass over the truth. Now, the nativity is spoken about here is not, you know, her being born because she already pre-existed with the Father, but that she was manifest as the Holy Spirit by the Father, the Invisible One. And that after she was manifest as such, as the Mother, as the Holy Spirit, as Wisdom, also she's known as Zoe, Z-O-E, in the Gnostic text, which also means life, and also called Barbello, which means the first begotten, or the um, uh, something along the lines of the ancient one, um, connected to the, again, the original Godhead. And when we, um, later in the show, I'll read from the, the Thracian Chronicles, you know, the one of the oldest written manuscripts, the newly released translation of it, where it also references uh, the Holy Spirit. 
as part of the the Godhead. All right, but I'm going to continue on with the wisdom of Solomon. Continuing, I believe this is chapter 7. This is Solomon continuing to implore the kings uh, as to seek out wisdom. And he talks about in this part about how he sought her out and placed more importance on wisdom than anything else, which is why he was known as to be uh, the wisest of all prophets, even though he fell away in his elderly age. I myself also am a mortal man like to all, and the offspring of him that was first made of the earth, and in my mother's womb was fashioned to be flesh in the time of ten months, being compacted in blood of the seed of man and the pleasure that came with sleep. And when I was born, I drew in the common air and fell upon the earth, which is like nature. And the first voice which I uttered was crying, as all others do. I was nursed in swaddling clothes, and that with cares. For there is no king that had any other beginning of birth. For all men have one entrance into life, and the like going out. Wherefore I prayed, and understanding was given me. I called upon God, and the spirit of wisdom came to me. I preferred her before scepters and thrones, and esteemed riches nothing in comparison of her. Neither compared I unto her any precious stone, because all gold in respect of her is as little sand and silver shall be counted as clay before her. I loved her above health and beauty and chose to have her instead of light, for the light that cometh from her never goeth out. All good things together came to me with her and innumerable riches in her hands, and I rejoiced in them all because wisdom goeth before them, and I knew that she was the mother of them. I learn diligently and do communicate her liberally. I do not hide her riches, for she is a treasure unto men that never faileth, which they that use become the friends of God, being commended for the gifts that come from learning. God hath granted me to seek as I would and to conceive as is meet for the things that are given me because it is he that leadeth unto wisdom and directeth the wise. For in his hand are both we and our words. All wisdom also, also knowledge of workmanship. For he hath given me certain knowledge of the things that are, namely, and this is important, pay attention to this. This is uh, chapter 7, verse 17, for those that may want to look it up later. For he hath given me certain knowledge of the things that are, namely, to know how the world was made, and the creation of the elements, the beginning, ending, and the midst of the times, the alterations of the turning of the sun, and the change of seasons the circuits of years, and the positions of the stars. Now, the reason I highlighted this is because as I show in my book on the flat earth as key to decrypt the book of Enoch, in Ecclesiastes chapter 1, which is also written by Solomon, I show that in that particular chapter, in that verse, it describes how the sun moves back and forth through the six gates of heaven as described by Enoch and that as it moves back and forth between the Tropic of Cancer and the Tropic of Capricorn that that's what creates the seasons that when it is located above the equator 
that is both the vernal equinox and the autumnal equinox when night and day are equal 12-hour proportion. Then when it reaches its northern limit at the Tropic of Cap uh, Cancer, that that is the height of summer, the summer solstice and the longest day of the year. And um, when it reaches its southern limits, that, that it is above the Tropic of Capricorn, and that is the winter solstice, the shortest day of the year for those in northern climates. And so using the Targum, I deciphered Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verse 5 and 6, because in, chapter, in verse 6, where the King James attributes such motion to the wind, in the Targum, it actually continues with the movement of the sun. And it is describing, as, as I said, the north and south movement of the sun back and forth between the tropics of Cancer and Capricorn, which are what create the seasons. And so this, these verses are absolutely true. Solomon was shown and told how the world was made. And he describes the earth, you know, being a flat plane, the sun being moving in circuit above it, and that all the luminaries, as Enoch describes, move in circuit above the earth, around Polaris, the one fixed star which has no movement and shows uh, where the center of the vaulted dome is located. All right, continuing. The natures of living creatures and the furies of wild beasts, the violence of winds and the reasonings of men, the diversities of plants and the virtues of roots, and all such things as are either secret or manifest, them I know. For wisdom, which is the worker of all things, taught me. For in her is an understanding spirit, holy, one only, manifold, subtle, lively, clear, undefiled, plain, not subject to hurt, loving the thing that is good, quick, which cannot be let it ready to do good. So, I mean, here... Basically, he says, for in her is an understanding spirit holy. I mean, that's the Holy Spirit. And uh, there's another verse, which I'll get to pretty soon, that also associates wisdom in the Holy Spirit as being one. Continuing, verse 23. Kind to man, steadfast, sure, free from care, having all power, overseeing all things and going through all understanding, pure and most subtle spirits. For wisdom is more moving than any motion. She passes and goeth through all things by reason of her, of her pureness. For she is the breath of the power of God and a pure influence among influence flowing from the glory of the Almighty. Therefore can no defiled thing fall into her, for she is the brightness of the everlasting light, the unspotted mirror of the power of God and the image of his goodness. Remember the, you know, pneuma, meaning breath, spirit. You know, that is the, the breath that was blown into Adam. She, the Holy Spirit, is our spiritual self, our, our immortal aspect of who we are. And being but one, she can do all things, and remaining in herself, she maketh all things new. And in all ages entering into holy souls, she maketh them friends of God and prophets. For God loveth none but him that dwelleth with wisdom for she is more beautiful than the sun and above all the order of stars. Being compared with the light, she is found before it. 
for after this cometh night, but vice shall not prevail against wisdom. In my opinion, this particular passage is linked to Genesis. Because in my opinion, when you examine Genesis, we have before the presentation of light. I'll read it for you. Genesis chapter 1 in verse 2 where it says, And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God, which is the Holy Spirit, the feminine Ruach HaKodesh, the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And then in verse 3 we have, And God said, Let there be light, which we know that is the Christ. And so, I mean, this is exactly what the Gnostic texts also reveal uh, about the fall of Sophia and in describing um, how Christ, the light of the world, was begotten of the Holy Spirit. Um, And so, you know, all the stories are the same. And Solomon, in this particular text, in verse 29, says, for she is more beautiful than the sun and above all the order of stars being compared with the light she is found before it and that's absolutely true in verse 2 you have description and mention of the holy spirit and then in verse 3 let there be light the christ being spoken of as coming forth as the light of the world For after this cometh night, but vice shall not prevail against wisdom. All right, chapter 8. Wisdom reacheth from one end to another mightily and sweetly. Doth she order all things? I loved her and sought her out from my youth. I desired to make her my spouse, and I was a lover of her beauty in that she is conversant with God. She magnifieth her nobility. Yea, the Lord of all things himself loved her. Remember that passage from Proverbs, uh, you know, which talked about God loving her uh, and that she was a handmaid unto him. In Proverbs 8, let uh, let me find it again really quick. Um, yes, here it is. It's in verse 30. Then I was beside, well, let me go back just a little bit. And when he set for the sea its limit that the water should not pass beyond it, set the foundations of the earth. Then I was beside him, a faithful handmaid. And while he was rejoicing in me day by day, I was rejoicing before him always. And so, you know, again, going back to the wisdom of Solomon, in that she is conversant with God, she magnifieth her nobility. Yea, the Lord of all things himself loved her, for she is privy to the mysteries of the knowledge of God and a lover of his works. If riches be a possession to be desired in this life, what is richer than wisdom than worketh all things? So, again, you know, in my opinion, uh, that love is reflective of the human family in the same manner of the, the love shared between the Godhead different aspects of the Godhead. Continuing. And if prudence works, who of all that are is a more cunning workman than she? And if a man love righteousness, her labors are virtues, for she teaches temperance and prudence, justice and fortitude, which are such things as men can have nothing more profitable in their life. 
If a man desire much experience, she knoweth things of old, and conjectureth aright what is to come. She knoweth the subtleties of speeches, and can expound dark sentences. She foreseeth signs and wonders, and the events of seasons and times. Here's that passage which uh, is linked to John chapter 14, verse 26, where it describes the Holy Spirit as the Comforter. This is the, verse 9. Therefore, I purpose to take her to me, to live with me, knowing that she would be a counselor of good things and a comfort in cares and grief. For her sake, I shall have estimation among the multitude and honor. Okay. Kathy said that um, my audio is going in and out, so let me... Tell me if this is better, Kathy. I may have been a little bit too close to the mic. And so let me just read uh, verse 9 once more. It says, um, and again, this is that passage which is related to chapter 14, verse 26 in John. Therefore, I purpose to take her to me to live with me, knowing that she would be a counselor of good things and a comfort in cares and grief. For her sake, I shall have estimation among the multitude and honor with the elders. Okay, good. Thank you, Kathy. I appreciate you, sister. I shall be found of a quick conceit in judgment and shall be admired in the sight of great men. When I hold my tongue, they shall bide my leisure. And when I speak, they shall give good ear unto me. If I talk much, they shall lay their hands upon their mouth. Moreover, by the means of her, I shall obtain immortality and leave behind me an everlasting memorial to them that come after me. Remember again, I said that it is the Spirit, the Holy Spirit within us, that aspect of us that is the part, our connecting link to the Godhead. And it's our spirits which inherit everlasting life. Uh, and so it's that aspect of us that can go on to uh, take part in salvation and in eternity with Christ. I shall set the people in order and the nations shall be subject unto me. Horrible tyrants shall be afraid when they do but hear of me. I shall be found good among the multitude and valiant in war. After I am come into mine house, I will repose myself with her, for her conversation hath no bitterness, and to live with her hath no sorrow, but mirth and joy. Now, when I considered these things in myself and pondered them in my heart, how that to be allied unto wisdom is immortality, and great pleasure it is to have her friendship, and in the works of her hands are infinite riches. And in the exercise of conference with her prudence, and in talking with her a good report, I went about seeking how to take her to me. For I was a witty child and had a good spirit. Yes, Rather, being good, I came into a body undefiled. Nevertheless, when I perceived that I could not otherwise obtain her, except God gave her me, and that was a point of wisdom also to know whose gift she was, I prayed unto the Lord and besought him. And with my whole heart I said, O God of my fathers and Lord of mercy, who hast made all things with thy word and ordained man through thy wisdom, 
that he should have dominion over the creatures creatures which thou hast made and order the world according to equity and righteousness and execute judgment which an upright heart give me wisdom that sitteth by thy throne and reject me not from among thy children and so here again we see that wisdom sitteth beside God on his throne for I, thy servant and son of thine handmaid, am a feeble person and of a short time and too young for the understanding of judgment and laws. For though a man be never so perfect among the children of men, yet if thy wisdom be not with him, he shall be nothing regarded. Thou hast chosen me to be a king of thy people and a judge of thy sons and daughters. Thou hast commanded me to build a temple upon thy holy mount and an altar in the city wherein thou dwellest, a resemblance of the holy tabernacle which thou hast prepared from the beginning. This is also important. And wisdom was with thee which knoweth thy works and was present when thou madest the world, and knew what was acceptable in thy sight, and right in thy commandments. O oh, send her out of thy holy heavens, and from thy throne of thy glory, that being present, she may labor with me, that I may know what is pleasing unto thee. Now, after I get to the end of this chapter, I will go to a passage from the book of Enoch, which also references this same thing, that wisdom is with the Most High God and had preexisted with him, and that she sits with him in the heavens even now. All right, and so continuing... Um, wisdom was with thee, which knoweth thy works and was present when thou madest the world. I mean, that's exactly what Proverbs speaks about. It goes into about you know how she was with him before the foundations of the world. All right, continue because I know we're going to run out of time quickly. Uh, verse eleven, and I believe this is. Chapter 10, I think. For she knoweth and understandeth all things, and she shall lead me soberly in my doings and preserve me in her power. So shall my works be acceptable, and then shall I judge thy people righteously and be um, I'm not sure. Let me see what you're speaking about here. Okay. Uh, hopefully the audio is all good. Give me a, a sound check, Kathy, when you can. Um, but I, I do pray that everything is loud and clear. All right, continuing. For what man is he that can know the counsel of God or who can think what the will of the Lord is? For the thoughts of mortal men are miserable and our devices are but uncertain. For, okay, great, thank you. I'll just leave the, the mic like this then and hopefully everything will be good. For the corruptible body presseth down the soul and the earthly tabernacle weigheth down the mind that museth upon many things. And hardly do we guess aright at things that are upon earth, and with labor do we find the things that are before us, but the things that are in heaven who hath searched out, and thy counsel who hath known, except thou give wisdom, and send thy Holy Spirit from above. So here in this particular verse, and 
I think this is chapter 9 or chapter 10, verse 17. And thy counsel who hath known, except thou give wisdom and send thy Holy Spirit from above. And so here, you know, we have wisdom and the Holy Spirit being related as the same entity. Verse 18. For so the ways of them which lived on the earth were reformed, and men were taught the things that are pleasing unto thee, and were saved through wisdom. Now this next particular chapter speaks about the particular ways that wisdom, the Holy Spirit, had preserved the various patriarchs. And you're really going to be shocked as to what Solomon uh, references as being her actions in working for and preserving the patriarchs. This was really a a mind blower uh, for me as well when I first came across it. All right, continuing. She preserved the first form father of the world that was created alone and brought him out of his fall. This, in my opinion, is speaking about um, when Adam was transformed into flesh and exiled here to paradise. I mean, kicked out of paradise and cast down to here to the earth. In drinking of the cup of forgetfulness, it was Sophia that went to him in the embodiment of Eve and spoke to him in reminder of who he was before his fall and how the same way to ascent back to his former estate was would be through Christ who would come and be born of a virgin and would redeem he and his uh, descendants. But that um, she is also referenced as Zoe life and that she instructed him as to his fall, which is exactly what it's speaking about here. And I'll actually elaborate more on this in probably the next show that I do on this particular topic. And I'll actually, because I'm starting with the canon and now I'm going into the Apocrypha which was part of the original canon as well. And then we'll look into, after I complete all of this, some of the uh, Nag Hammadi codices and some of the other uh, extra-biblical texts so that I can help you to understand this theme as it plays out through the entirety of the biblical narrative. Because I figure if I'm going to teach you about the Holy Spirit and and her being female, I might as well give it, give you all of it so you can understand it in its fullness. All right, continuing verse two. And gave him power to rule all things. But when the unrighteous went away from her in his anger, this is speaking about Cain, he perished also in the fury wherewith he murdered his brother. For whose cause the earth being drowned with the flood, wisdom again preserved it and directed the course of the righteous in a piece of wood of small value. So here it's speaking about wisdom as helping preserve Noah. Moreover, the nations in their wicked conspiracy being confounded, she found out the righteous and preserved him blameless unto God and kept him strong against his tender compassion toward his son. When the ungodly perished, she delivered the righteous man who fled from the fire which fell down upon the five cities. These two verses are speaking about Abraham and Lot. Of whose wickedness, even to this day, the wasteland that smoketh is a testimony and plants bearing fruit that never come to ripeness. And a standing pillar of salt is a monument of an unbelieving soul. For regarding not wisdom, they get not only this hurt, 
that they knew not the things which were good, but also left behind them to the world a memorial of their foolishness, so that in the things wherein they offended, they could not so much as be hid. But wisdom delivereth from pain those that attended upon her. When the righteous fled from his brother's wrath, she guided him in right paths, showed him the kingdom of God, and gave him knowledge of holy things. This is speaking about Esau running from, I mean, Jacob running from Esau. Made him rich in his travels and multiplied the fruit of his labors. That's speaking of when he was with Laban. In the covetousness of such as oppressed him, she stood by him and made him rich. She defended him from his enemies and kept him safe from those that lay in wait. And in a sore conflict, she gave him the victory that he might know that goodness is stronger than all. When the righteous was sold, she forsook him not, but delivereth him from sin. This is speaking about Joseph. She went down with him into the pit and left him not in bonds till she brought him the scepter of the kingdom and power against those that oppressed him. As for them that had accused him, she showed them to be liars and gave him perpetual glory. She delivered the righteous people and blameless seed from the nation that oppressed them. That was speaking about Potiphar's wife and how she accused uh, Joseph of, you know, trying to rape her. And then, you know, the the Hebrews being freed from the bondage of Egypt through Moses. I mean, it just goes on and on about how wisdom was, you know, part of redeeming and preserving and protecting Israel. She entered into the soul of the servant of the Lord and withstood dreadful kings and wonders and signs. And that's Moses. Rendered to the righteous a reward of their labors, guided them in a marvelous way, and was unto them for a cover by day and a light of stars in the night season. The, you remember the uh, that they were led by light by night? and a, a, a cloud by day. This is supposedly, that was the Holy Spirit. That was she, wisdom. I'll read it again. Um, Render to the righteous a reward of their labors, guided them in a marvelous way, and was unto them for a cover by day, and a light of stars in the night season brought them through the Red Sea and led them up out of the bottom of the deep. Therefore the righteous spoiled the ungodly and praised thy holy name, O Lord, and magnified with one accord thy hand and fought for them. And so the Holy Spirit helped um, also a Moses to split the sea. You know, that she's the power of God, the breath, the wind that parted the seas. You know, just as uh, the the Spirit of God hovering over the waters, she is that breath, that wind, uh, the pneuma, the Spirit, the Ruach HaKodesh. Therefore the righteous spoiled the ungodly and praised thy holy name, O Lord, and magnified with one accord thine hand that fought for them. For wisdom opened the mouth of the dumb, and made the tongues of them that cannot speak eloquent. That's speaking about Moses. Because uh, when he was a young child, he had burned his tongue uh, and his mouth. And that's why he was unable to speak clearly. And that's why Aaron was appointed to be his spokesperson. Continuing, she prospered their works in the hand of the holy prophet. They went through the wilderness that was not inhabited and pitched tents in places where they lay no way. They stood against their enemies 
and were avenged of their adversaries. When they were thirsty, they called upon thee, and water was given them out of the flinty rock, and their thirst was quenched out of the hard stone. For by what things their enemies were punished, by the same in their need were benefited. Um, I'm going to actually stop there. You can continue reading on. There's a lot of very interesting passages in, in this particular chapter. I'll read one more. I want to skip down to it, though. It's actually in the next chapter. I believe it's chapter 13. But it says this, and this is very interesting as well. For thine incorruptible spirit is in all things. Therefore, chastise them, them by little and little that offend, and warnest them by putting them in remembrance, wherein they have offended, that leaving their wickedness they may believe on thee, O Lord. This is the passage that I'm referencing. For it was thy will to destroy by the hands of our fathers both those old inhabitants of thy holy land, speaking about the giants, whom thou hatest for doing most odious works of witchcraft and wicked sacrifices, and also those merciless murderers of children and devourers of man's flesh and the feasts of blood with their priests out of the midst of their idolatrous crew and the parents that killed with their own hands souls destitute of help, that the land which thou esteemest above all other might receive a worthy colony of God's children. For those that did not hear the two shows that Gary and I did, Gary Wayne and I did on the lost book of King Aga Bashan, we spoke about that text, how it describes the giants as being those that offered up in sacrifice the children of what they called the smaller selves, the humanity, and how they were the ones that cannibalized human flesh. They even raised humankind uh, as um, domesticated animal to consume. And so... I do recommend people listen to those shows because this this passage is directly in reference to that. All right. The next, I want to uh, let me find the verse from Enoch first, and then I want to share something about the. Lost in the hidden books. Because everybody believes that, you know, the Gnostic texts or the uh, the Nakamati codices, which were hidden for so very long, that if it's not in the Bible, it's unnecessary. But in truth, when you look at even the book of Enoch or the book of Ezra, it speaks about God commands Ezra and Enoch to hide many books and to preserve them for only the elect. And so let me first read this verse from the book of Enoch concerning wisdom. And then I'll get into that. This is uh, chapter 42 of the book of Enoch. Wisdom found not a place on earth where she could inhabit. Her dwelling, therefore, is in heaven. Wisdom went forth to dwell among the sons of men, but she obtained not a habitation. Wisdom returned to her place and seated herself in the midst of the angels, but iniquity went forth after her return, who unwittingly found a habitation and resided among men, among them as rain in the desert and as they do in a thirsty land. And so you can see that the Holy Spirit 
um, not finding a place here, went back up and dwelt with the Father and the Son in the midst of the angels, and that iniquity took its place here with humanity. And so, I mean, so many things uh, with regard to uh, the Holy Spirit and all the connections. Uh, I do recommend, again, people listen to the first show that I did where I brought forth this knowledge, this information from um, the church fathers. But really, really quickly, I want to cover how some of the secretive books and how certain books were commanded by the Most High to be hidden from the majority the masses, those that are not worthy of its secrets and that cannot understand the advanced teachings. Even Enoch, he wrote, From them I heard all things and understood what I saw, that which will not take place in this generation, but in a generation which is to succeed at a distant period on account of the elect. He knew he was writing for a distant generation. In the book of Esdras, it says, um, this is from the book of Esdras. It says, Hear these words, O Israel. Our fathers at the beginning were strangers in Egypt, from whence they were delivered, and received the law of life which they kept not, which ye also have to transgress after them. Then was the land, even the land of Sion, parted among you by lot. But your fathers and you yourselves had done unrighteousness and have not kept the ways which the highest commanded you. And for as much as he is a righteous judge, he took from you in time the thing that he had given you. And now are ye here and ye brethren among you. Therefore, if so be that ye will subdue your own understanding and reform your hearts, ye shall be kept alive, and after death ye shall obtain mercy. For after death shall the judgment come, when we shall live again, and then shall the names of the righteous be manifest, and the works of the ungodly be declared. Let no man therefore come unto me now, nor seek after me these forty days. So I took the five men as he commanded me, and we went into the field and remained there. And the next day, behold, a voice called me, saying, Ezra, open thy mouth and drink that I give thee to drink. Then opened I my mouth, and behold, he reached me a full cup, which was full as it were with water, but the color of it was like fire. And I took it and drank, and when I had drunk of it, my heart uttered understanding, and wisdom grew in my breast, for my spirit strengthened my memory." and my mouth was open and shut no more. The highest gave understanding unto the five men, and they wrote the wonderful visions of the night that were told, which they knew not, and they sat forty days, and they wrote in the day, and at night they ate bread. As for me, I spake in the day, and I held not my tongue by night. In forty days they wrote two hundred and four books, and it came to pass when the forty days were filled that the highest spake, saying, The first that thou hast written, publish openly, that the worthy and unworthy may read it. But keep the seventy last, that they mayest deliver them only to such as be wise among the people. For in them is the spring of understanding, the fountain of wisdom, and the stream of knowledge. And I did so. Second Ezra chapter 14, verses 28 through 48. And so you can see even Ezra was instructed to uh, present many of the texts that he was inspired to write, but to keep many um, from the majority, that they were only to be given to the elect. And so even among the holy people, there were these smaller groups of elect that were found worthy. And in my opinion, the Essenes, 
the holy Essenes, those that were part of the the true uh, disciples and followers of Christ, they were part of that group that had some of these advanced and elect teachings, and that, in my opinion, the Nag Hammadi codices are portioned and part of these very advanced and very elect teachings, and that the reason most people don't understand them is because they don't even have understanding of their own Bible, of just the 66 or the 80 books of the, of the Holy Bible. If you don't understand that the Holy Spirit is female or that we preexisted or that uh, there is, that the devil has his own seed here, so much of these advanced teachings you just simply won't understand. And I mean, that's directly from the words of Christ in Matthew 13. He says, I utter, I utter secrets that have been, I utter secrets that have been kept since the foundation of the world. And then he was speaking about specifically the serpent seed, the wheat and the tares, the parable of the kingdom, uh, the enemy sneaking into the garden and sowing the tares, how the tares are the children of the wicked one, how the wicked one, who it says that Cain was of the wicked one, of, when you look up that word of, meaning son or child of, that um, if you don't understand these things and they're clearly written in the Bible, how are, to, how are you to understand all these other extra biblical texts which affirm these things, but you think opposed and contrary because you're not even understanding the canonical material and so that's why in my opinion most people think that a lot of these other teachings are um gnostic as they say all right god bless all good night and thank you for listening be blessed shalom